Thank you. I'm honored to be here on my first trip to China, and I congratulate the organizers on a very successful conference. I'll be speaking about work with some exceptional young collaborators, Johannes Knaut, Svartak Tarik, who is here, Andreas Semberg, and Tremek Vitasik. Piotic numbers are a completion of the rationals with respect to a funny norm. Equation one shows that norm. It's funny because you would think that on the right-hand side, you would have at least the prime number p e to the power of positive p. E. But it's not that way. p e is a small number in the piatic norm, and that's what makes everything work. So for instance, the piatic norm of p itself is 1 over p. The piatic norm, pardon me, there should have been a subscript p right there. The piatic norm of p squared is 1 over p squared, and so forth. Whereas, if you have some number, let's just say a, which is 1, 2, 3, up to p minus 1, its piatic norm is 1. And by fiat, we simply say that 0 has piatic norm of 0. Well, any general non-zero piatic number can be written as a formal series of this form. Again, it looks funny because I'm running the series to arbitrarily large positive powers of p, but that's okay in a piatic sense because positive powers of p become piatically small. So this sum, this sum converges provided the so-called digits, a sub m, are bounded. And in fact, we can choose them all to be either 0 or 1, 2, 3, up to p minus 1. Let's get a little more intuition for this kind of expansion by working out the piatic expression for the number minus 1 in the case where the prime p equals 2. First, we write minus 1 as 1 divided by 1 minus 2. That was trivial algebra. And then we expand this second expression as a geometric series, which is OK in the two adic numbers, because remember, 2 is small. So minus 1, when you write it, oops, minus 1, when you write it as a piatic expansion, a two-adic expansion, expands forever to the left, and every digit is 1. Let me draw that. Let me draw this piatic expansion in a way that will be, I hope, very suggestive of ADS-CFT. I want to have a tree whose main trunk, if you like, starts at infinity and goes all the way up to zero. And I want to consider paths on this tree which start at infinity and go upward, as I'd like to think of it, upward toward the boundary of the tree in some particular way. And the way in which I steer up through the tree will uniquely determine a piatic number because it amounts to specifying the, the expansion that I wrote in the previous page. The information that in that expansion is encoded in the path in the following way. Where you leave the main trunk determines the overall piatic norm. So to back up for a moment, the overall piatic norm is determined by this overall factor. So that first factor is controlled by where you leave the dark red trunk. And then every subsequent choice you make in steering your way up the tree corresponds to choosing the next chaotic digit from right to left. We should think of each node on the tree as a rational approximation to the eventual chaotic number that we find. The chaotic number that I found in this particular uh, path ends in the digits 0010.1. And a rational approximation of it is this number a in the tree, whose piatic expression is 0 0.1. An important property we'll have to keep in mind in future slides is that the piatic numbers have a, a subset of the piatic integers 
that is numbers with no fractional part, no 0.1 or 0.11. So piadic integers are in fact a compact set. They're the numbers whose piadic norm is no greater than one. Another important set for us will be the piadic numbers whose norm is exactly one. In other words, the unit circle in the piadics. And that is this set u sub p. All right, so of course, you can see where I'm going. I want the tree to be piadic ADS, or something like it. And I'm going to introduce a depth coordinate, z0, valued in integer powers of the prime p, whereas the boundary coordinate z is valued in the piadics. And then the depth coordinate of piadic ADS, the z0 coordinate, should be understood as a sort of piadic accuracy. The approximation we were talking about, A, the approximation A to Z, is good to within an accuracy that is the piadic norm of Xenon. Now, the rest of my talk is going to be organized as follows. I will describe some previous work, including the piadic strain, eternal symmetry, and piadic yield theory. I will tell you another wonderful fact, although I won't prove it, about this tree which makes it really seem like ADS. The tree is in fact a quotient of piadic relatives of SL2R and its maximal compact subgroup. I'll tell you also about field extensions of the piadics that lead to trees that are analogous, I claim, to Euclidean ADS n plus one for any n. And then I'll tell you about a natural classical dynamics on the tree that allows you to define correlators in a piadic field theory. It's very similar to the story of bottom-up ADS CFT. In particular, I'll show you, well, not two-point functions, really, but I'll show you three-point and four-point functions, which exhibit interesting comparisons to the usual formulas for real ADS n plus one. But there's a crucial property of the piadics that I'll come to only late in my talk called ultrametricity, which makes the four-point function much simpler than you expect. I will also describe at least a little bit of another work that came out only shortly after ours by a Caltech group. And in particular, they described the piadic analog of the BTZ black hole in Euclidean signature. And I'll indicate a few possible future directions. The piadic strain is well known, so let me go through it quickly. It's based on the analogy between the two lines of equation five. The symmetrized Meissiana amplitude, which John Schwartz told us about, can be expressed in terms of uh, what's called a local, uh, a local gamma function, which is a, a small modification of the usual Euler gamma function. And when you write the Meissiana amplitude, the ordinary Meissiana amplitude in this way, it generalizes very simply to the piadic numbers, where now these local gamma functions I have a closed form expression, and I wrote it down for you. The only thing I haven't told you, really, is how to do piadic integration. But it's really quite simple. Essentially, all you have to say is that the measure of the piadic integers is one, and the measure of some piadic multiple of any set is going to be the piadic norm of that multiple times the measure of the original set. An amazing fact is that the product of all the local gamma functions equals one. And this leads to a so-called adelic relation, first written down by Freud and Witten in 1987. For the Venetiano amplitude, amplitude, you write the Venetiano amplitude as one divided by a product of piadic amplitudes. This amazing formula may seem a little less surprising if you check that for a rational number z, the ordinary absolute value of the rational number, which I denote as absolute value with subscript infinity, is similarly one divided by the product of the piadic absolute values. Now, what I'm after in piadic ADS CFT is correlators, very much of the sort, that entered into the Veneziano amplitude. Remember that up to issues of gauge fixing, 
we could write that Venetiana amplitude that I had in the previous transparency as some correlator of composite operators written in terms of a free scalar X. So let me just try to study a little bit more systematically this kind of correlator in a theatic context. And of course I expect that there will be two point functions of a form like I've given here, and three point functions of a form that I've given here. And this functional dependence on the positions z, all of which are piatic numbers, will be completely fixed by invariance under piatic linear fractional transformations, which play the role of the conformal group. Of course, when we get to four point functions, we don't expect such a simple dependence on the z's as I've written in equation nine because there are cross ratios, and I'll have more to say about them soon. Now let me come out with the amazing assertion that's been known since 1972, that if you take the maximal compact subgroup of this piatic conformal group, that maximal compact subset happens to be PGL2 of the piatic integers. And then this quotient really is the tree previously discussed. I'm not going to demonstrate it, but we can talk about it afterwards if you want to know how that happens. Now, having established the hope that this tree is the right piatic replacement for ADS, I want to do some kind of ADS CFT on the tree, starting from the bulk and deriving boundary correlators. So here we go. If I were doing it in ordinary Euclidean ADS2 for the reals, I would write down some action for a scalar of such a form, and I would turn the crank of ADS CFT. Well, let me just write down an action for a scalar defined on the tree. Phi sub A is a real number defined at every node A of the tree. And so I write down some action which is also a real number, and I'll turn the same crank of ADS CFT and derive the kinds of correlators that I wrote down in the previous transparency. And I'll do it step by step, very much in the way that we would have always done it for uh, the real case. In particular, step one is to find solutions to the linearized equation of motion for this scalar phi. And in particular, to find a bulk-to-bulk -bulk propagator which takes this form where I'll tell you in a moment what this zeta sub p thing is. Um, d of a and b is the distance on the graph, the distance on the tree, meaning how many steps do you have to take to get from a to b. It's a well-defined number because the graph is a tree. And there's a relation between the mass, again, a real number, and the dimension, also a real number, which is quite reminiscent of the usual ADS CFT relation between bulk masses and boundary dimensions. Now let me tell you about the so-called local zeta functions. We define a local zeta function for the reals in a way that seems rather arbitrary, but let me just say that's my definition. Um, and then I have some some perhaps more motivated definition of the local zeta function for the prime p. It's motivated because I can write the Riemann zeta function as what I think is called an Euler product over all times p of these local zeta functions uh, for, for each p. If you add in a, a, a relation for gamma functions, then this previous claim that the product over, over all v of the gammas equals 1 is an equivalent statement of, of Riemann's functional relation to the zeta function. My other little technical detour here is that I really want to tell you about ADS n plus 1 slash CFT n. And to do that, I had better introduce n-dimensional vector spaces over the PIs. Well, there's a nice way to do that. It's the so-called unrectified extension of the PIX, whose degree n is to be thought of as the dimension of the vector space that we're considering over the PIX. So I've tried to draw it as well as I can uh, for the case n equals 2. This would be called quadratic extension of the PIX. And there's a norm 
there's a norm that I'll call uh, norm subscript Q uh, that, that is very similar to the piano norm, and they're the same uh, depth direction Z0 is, is still uh, useful. So, so there's very little difference, really, between the, uh, between the two uh, cases of, of, of unextended and extended pianics. Now, let me speed up a little bit and remind you of the way we compute three-point functions in the real case. I simply take bulk to boundary propagators, I make them meet at some bulk point, and then integrate over this bulk point. The bulk and boundary propagators, it turns out, are nicely expressed in terms of the local data function. I'll have more to say about that in the future. And the three-point function comes out as the obvious product of uh, the Z, ij's, up to a normalization, which itself is easily written in terms of the local data functions. I like this expression for this coefficient C OOO because it doesn't involve the transcendental number pi. Pardon me. It doesn't involve pi. And in fact, if we simply replace infinity by p, we wind up with the correct answer for the three-point function of a piatic field theory, according to the prescription that I'll develop in the next transparency. So in other words, we can continue from the real case to the piatic case, uh, as, as soon as we've written everything in terms of local data functions, in a surprisingly e easy way except for one little detail. Here, you see there's a factor of two in the denominator. And here, there's not. That's a bit of an embarrassment to us. We did not give any deep explanation for that mismatch. All right, so here's how you actually do a calculation in theatic CFT. You figure out what the bulk of boundary propagator is, I wrote its form, perhaps we need not discuss it in detail. The coefficient is determined in the usual way. And then, in order to calculate the sum over all positions x, it's convenient to, uh, to consider the bulk to boundary propagators as running all to the point c, and then use bulk to bulk propagators to run from c to x. And so you wind up with the sum of this form that controls the overall normalization and gives you this claimed answer that is so similar to the real case. Now let's go right on to the four-point function, which is very entertaining because you can write it all in one line for the real case and the piatic case, as long as we're only looking at the leading logarithmic behavior of the four-point function in the real case. By leading logarithmic behavior, I mean that if we take z12 and z34 small compared to z13 and z24, then, then the complicated four-point function in the real ADF-CFT situation um, has only this simple uh, logarithmic behavior uh, in, in a limit I just, just wrote. And, and that same behavior is recovered for the piatics using a, uh, a calculation very much similar to the one I just showed you in the previous transparency. It's so similar that, as you see, I didn't even write subscript infinity or subscript p. You can write either one as you please and the formulas are right. Now, what's more remarkable, perhaps, than that continuation from the reals to the piatics, is that the full expression for the piatics, the full four-point function, at least the full four-point function that comes from a contact diagram, is very simple. This logarithmic behavior that I wrote in equation 23 is here, and it's corrected only by a couple of small, finite terms inside square brackets. I'd like to ask, where did this logarithmic behavior come from, in the, in, in the sense of piatic numbers of the tree? And why is there no dependence on the other cross-ratio that I wrote in equation 24 as you filled it? More often, it would be called v, but I was using v for something else. Now let me tell you about ultrametricity. Piatic norms are ultrametric in the sense that the piatic norm of x plus y is less than or equal to the supremum of the norms of x and y. This seemingly innocent inequality 
implies a small theorem whose proof I have all this transparency. It says that if the cross ratio u is less than one, then the other cross ratio u tilde equals one. How can it be that from only inequalities we recover this equality? Well, the key is the so-called tall isosceles lemma. Suppose you have x plus y plus z equal zero, then up to relabeling of x, y, and z, you'll have x equals y greater than or equal to z, where I meant to say really normal of x equals normal of y greater than or equal to normal z. The proof of it is instructive. We can get this bit for free just by choosing of x, y, and z, the smallest, the one with the smallest norm. So having done so, we only have to show that the two of larger norms have equal norms. And to do it, we use the ultrametric property twice. The norm of x equals the norm of y plus z, and that must be less than or equal to the norm of y, because we assume that the norm of z is less than or equal to the norm of y. Likewise, we can show that the norm of y is less than or equal to the norm of x, and that's what we want. Let me not go through the proof of this theorem about cross ratios, but just assure you that it is a repetitive application of this tall isosceles lemma. I'm running out of time, but I can tell you where the log u came from. If u is less than 1, then there's a diagram similar to what I drew here, where z1 and z2 are essentially close together, and so are z3 and z4. And when you connect them on the tree, that is to say, when you connect them in the bulk, lines on the tree, paths on the tree, from z1 to z3, and from z2 to z4, run together. They coincide for many steps. The number of steps along which they coincide equals minus the log of u. And now you can see why there's a log in the four-point function. This subway diagram, as we like to call it, since it looks like the diagram of a subway system, um, allows us to shift x all over the piatic tree. And as we shift it as far as it will go along this central leg, there are log u equivalent locations for b, and that's where this log u comes from. Okay, the log also suggests some kind of anomalous dimensions in the dual field theory. For lack of time, let me just speed through it and suggest that there is an operator O squared whose dimension is slightly different from the dimension of O. And then if you use an OPE to develop this four-point function of O, you would naturally expect that you get an expression like this second to last one, which when expanded in small delta does give you the desired logarithm. And a similar mechanism, as has been previously mentioned in this conference, is responsible for log u behavior in class ads -CFT. Let me tell you just one important thing about uh, piatic field theory, and that is that they look terribly like ordinary field theory, but simpler. There's a Fourier transform. There can be propagators. This exponent s need not be 2. That's a funny feature, but it's not assumption. There are loop divergences, which you might regulate in the ordinary way. There are, it's believed, Wilson Fisher fixed points. But there is something very special. The something very special is that when you do Wilsonian RG and you integrate out a momentum shell, the effective action has a very simple form. The effective action has this kinetic term for phi, which does not get renormalized. And then it has some effective polynomial action um, for, for phi itself. So why, in integrating out the hard momenta, do we not renormalize this or generate some other sort of derivative interactions? Well, it's because of ultrametricity again. 
I illustrated it perhaps in too much detail by computing this underground diagram, which in ordinary 5 4 theory would renormalize the kinetic term. But because of altruistic, it does not in the PIs. And I believe that this phenomenon of not generating derivative terms is going to be related to the simplicity of the four point function. I believe that the OPE of O with O is probably very sparse effectively with no descendants. I think I'm out of time, so I'm sorry I couldn't mention um, some other work um, by the Caltech group and, and the, the important background work by the Stanford group, but I'll leave them in my transparencies for people to read. And let me just go straight to conclusions to tell you that holographic direction is very natural in describing the piatic numbers. This depth coordinate z is piatic accuracy. If you follow your nose in formulating simple classical dynamics on the tree, you get endpoint functions closely analogous to standard results in ADS-CFT, but written in terms of these lovely local zeta functions. I'd like to ask why are the piatic results so close to classic ADS-CFT? but not quite the same. I'd like to ask, what about fluctuating ge geometry in the tree graph? I'd like to ask, what about Lorentzian signature? I don't have good answers to any of these questions. Ultrametricity leads to these wonderful simplifications, especially in the four-point function. But one more area where I think uh, there's opportunity is to give a more symmetry-based presentation of pianic CFTs and perhaps even ambitiously to find explicit ADS CFT dual pairs. Thank you. Absolutely. There's a well-known story from piatic field theory, especially Lerner and Miserov, starting from uh, the so-called Dyson uh, hierarchical models, where you do explicit step-by-step -step spin blocking from, from one layer of the tree to the next. Um, and that spin blocking leads to even some rigorous results by Sinai um, on the normalization group. And the second is ultrametricity is a property of uh, states in spin classes. Is there some connection to this order? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Ultrametricity is the property, according to several people in the past Parisian company, of the state space of spin classes. Do you think there will be some connection to this order? Well, probably yes, but I, I can't offer you any wisdom. Okay, so just uh, two comments. So one is that um, in the symmetry version of the model, uh, you can uh, actually work out the, the OPE in, in detail and indeed uh, confirm that there aren't any descendants uh, and, it, and it, you know you can see, for example, that it obeys associativity uh, even without descendants. Um, I guess we tried to interpret it in terms of the sort of that the piatics are sort of more discrete uh, than the real numbers, and so the derivatives aren't really necessary to give you a solution across them. Um, the other comment in response to Elias's question was that um, so uh, if you want to view this as as the sitter space instead of anti the sitter space, which is how we were viewing it. Uh, then uh, uh, the Nerfman and Ines and collaborators uh, have for a long time uh, been, been saying that the sort of, this sort of ultramatricity should be related to the sort of classic behavior in the sitter in the sitter space. I'm not sure if everything is in the room right now, but I want, I want to say there is quite a bit of literature. Thank you. you skipped over on the general inflation and could you just tell us a little bit about that? 
I'm, I'm only giving a partial summary of the work by Harlow and collaborators. He's right behind you, so you can, I'm sure, tell you more. It's an idealization of internal inflation in which a given causal region can nucleate new distant vacua that fall out of contact with one another and then split again. And you might think of the uh, future boundary as the two out of numbers, um, which, which, because of their disconnectedness, as, as Dan points out, um, might be more descriptive of a late time multiverse than the ordinary forward time boundary of the city. Okay.